welcome today. And we have a very uh, special guest today. Um, it, for those of you that are new, just some quick background about HAE. We're a volunteer managed, uh, locally organized nonprofits, uh, connecting Harvard alumni, faculty, staff, and friends uh, throughout the university and globally. HAE is all about connecting you to your community and resources, and we do that through our 14 local chapters. Uh, please join us on harvardae.org slash join. Uh, today's guest, uh, is a, he's a HubSpot alum, 10-year marketing veteran with a passion for helping businesses grow in a digital environment. Uh, Nick Sal served as a principal inbound professor with HubSpot, uh, who helped teach marketing departments how to ditch their traditional outbound marketing and transform into successful inbound businesses. Nick currently works as VP of Agency Services at Media Junction, one of HubSpot's few elite level solution partners, working with dozens of companies each year on getting up and running with inbound marketing and HubSpots. So please join me in welcoming Nick. Thank you very much, Joe. It's an honor to be here with all of you. And I uh, was doing a little bit of housekeeping with Joe and the awesome uh, group of volunteers who helped put on this program. And I'm about to go into presentation mode here. And what I've learned is based on how Keynote works on Apple, and I'm sure you folks know the hack that I'm missing, but for the sake of time, we'll just deal with it, uh, which is when I go into presenter mode, I will not be able to see the chat window on the side, which is fine. Joe is going to be our moderator. I've got some great material I want to take you folks through uh, today. We'll start with the first couple get to know you slides, and then I want to go right into the material and I'll go fairly swiftly through the content. But any questions you have are certainly welcome. You leave them in the chat window for Joe to answer. And if it's pressing or, or timely, Joe's welcome to take himself off mute and, and let me know what we want to cover. <clears throat> so thank you again. Without further ado, this is Inbound Reboot, Five Secrets Marketers Wish They Had Known About Implementing Inbound the First Time Around. Uh, Joe already gave me an excellent introduction. So I'll just throw up these, this, these stats to show you folks that I've been thinking about inbound marketing, content marketing, how to use uh, now extremely you know, successful, popular tools like HubSpot. I've been thinking about it for a long time. I'm presenting and training and consulting to companies about doing it for a long time. I was doing it this morning. I'll be doing it this afternoon after I'm done with this talk. I eat, sleep, and breathe how to be successful with inbound and content marketing, especially powered on HubSpot. So just want you to know you're in good company if that's something you're interested in bringing to your startup, to your business, and your organization. And I always, and one of the big things, by the way, that makes inbound work is understanding the context of people in addition to having great content. So I hope I have some good content here. I'm wondering if you folks can arm me with some context. So if you are up for the challenge, and by the way, it's statistically proven that if you participate in chat and stuff like that, even if it's just once or twice in these types of webinars, your retention rate of the material goes up. So if you wouldn't mind doing a little bit of participation here and letting us know, letting me know your context. If you want to share your organization's name, if you're working for a company or a business, your location in the world. If you can let us know what your, what your role is. Are you the owner, the founder? Are you a marketer? Are you a generalist? Are you an intern? And yeah, I'd love to know. I would like to please take yourself off mute and feel free to jump in. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if people want to be able to do that off mute, I'll welcome. You can raise your hand or what have you. Um, otherwise, you can put it in chat if you're just more comfortable with that. But anybody else, you can give me a hand raise or take yourself off mute if you'd like to introduce yourself. Um, otherwise, you can use the chat window. Or you can cold call, Nick. Yeah, or you can just call me live. You know, welcome to Antonio, founder of Farah Hotels, MBA. He's at calling from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Excellent. So Brazil's in the house. We have some folks here in London. So later in the afternoon or in the early evening. Welcome, Ileana, marketing manager. Fantastic. And this, this deck is going to be right up your alley. Welcome to John Schechter. Business development at Auto Store Systems, Providence. Okay, so I'm calling, by the way, I'm, I'm in Norwell, just 18 miles south of Boston. That's how Joe and I got to know each other. Uh, we were on another uh, presentation event at uh, MIT a couple of years back, and we're always looking for an opportunity to speak to you folks. Uh, welcome, Ruffin, Strategy and Operations, fantastic. Yeah, and I think the cameras are also welcome to turn on because you guys can network and see each other as well. Um, we have Jujubi in Austin and LA, nice. Now. Okay, so this is excellent, folks, for the background. I want to ask the most important question, if you can weigh in on this, because I'd like to keep this in, in, in mind, is have any of you ever used HubSpot? Are you using HubSpot now? And or have you practiced doing content marketing or inbound marketing? Because again, I'm not here to be the HubSpot salesperson. This will not be a HubSpot demo commercial presentation. 
these are the things that after working with 200 companies, onboarding them uh, into inbound, working with dozens of these companies and major projects through the agency world that I'm in now, what I've seen didn't matter what the product was, didn't matter what the software was. These are the things that when I went back and asked those most successful customers who found their way through to success, those users, those marketers, if you will, what they would have done differently, what were the, what were the ingredients that got them through to success? It's these pieces and it's, and you may be surprised or maybe not that surprised to realize it wasn't about finding the coolest, niftiest, best interface of a feature or a tool, the speeds and feeds, if you will. Okay, so we're seeing that John has just started using HubSpot. Great, Mark is using HubSpot. Haven't used HubSpot before, Ileana, fantastic. So at least you folks should know it will not be a deep in the weeds, you gotta know how HubSpot works type of a presentation. These are all the best practices that if you were going to ever consider using HubSpot or uh, Clavio or ActiveCampaign or even Eloqua or Marketo or any of these other software platforms, you'd be better served thinking uh, by taking these lessons from the marketers and users who have gone through the minefield first before us. I'm gonna bring some of those lessons back to you. All right, so it looks like there's sort of a mix here. People, some people have used HubSpot, some people are looking at it, some people have never used it, fantastic. So thanks everybody. With that being said, I'm gonna go into presentation mode. T Joe, I'll count on you to jump in if there's something that um, we should pause and discuss. Otherwise, sure. folks, I'm gonna move swift. Oh, look at that, the chat window stayed after all. I thought that was gonna be an issue. All right, folks. Let's get everybody oriented here and I won't burn too much time on this, but what is inbound marketing? Can we all just level set on that? What are we talking about? Because some people think it's one thing, some people think it's the other. Here's a nice little definition I like. Holistic, data-driven approach to marketing that's about attracting individuals to your brand, your website, right, your app, and using techniques and tools to convert them, capture their email information, drop a cookie, that type of thing, and keep in touch with them until they become lasting customers. It was very, it's become very popular in this last decade or so of this growth uh, because it's doing the types of things that people are responding to in the internet today. SEO, blogging, those types of things, not the traditional playbook um, that is really just going out the window entirely, especially in this current economic environment that we're in of the, of the classic salesperson, the classic uh, marketing playbooks. Essentially, it's any type of marketing that its premise is to pull people towards you, to get found by people, to have people want to beat a path to your door, creating stuff that's so useful and so helpful. And it involves content. Yes, inbound marketing can sometimes be replaced with content marketing, or often people might call it social media marketing or, or SEO. All of those things overlap when we talk about inbound. And as you can imagine, it involves a lot of work. Um, you start thinking about writing blog articles, publishing white papers, creating eBooks, making videos, all of what goes into the discipline of SEO and making sure all of that gets syndicated out into social media feeds and monitored and so on. Um, it's a lot for any company to take on if they've never been publishing and being content centric before. And so there is a publication component to it, yes, but there's also a sort of infrastructure funnel uh, data-driven approach to it. So it's, when you think of inbound, the tactics I'm going to talk about best practices for help us in these key areas if we're practicing it on HubSpot or otherwise. Okay, getting traffic, getting leads, getting customers, and analyzing to improve. It's all of the disciplines and the tool sets that can be used to drive these outcomes in what is often called a funnel sort of mindset. But it will never work, folks, unless it's got the right content served to the right person at the right time and in the right format for them. That is why it sometimes takes software, a lot of planning, a lot of discipline, a lot of learning, and a lot of education uh, to get it done. But I want to give you an overview of that's what inbound is all about. And certainly if you Googled what is inbound marketing, you'll find a, a treasure trove of articles to get you further oriented after today. But why should we care about this right now? Uh, fellow, not fellow, but members of the HubSpot alum, I'm sorry, not HubSpot, Harvard Alumni Entrepreneurs Association. Why should you care? Well, I don't think I have to tell you that marketing, even what we were doing a year ago, has been disrupted. The companies that could say, well, people walk into my store, or our sales reps see them on the showroom floor, or we fly out to people, uh, we mail them those things, we take our time, you know, uh, uh, we wait for them to call us. That type of stuff we can't afford to do it anymore. The businesses that are going to survive know that they must acknowledge the consumer is digital, is online. The consumer will be reading and clicking versus handshaking 
and coming in through the door uh, and meeting with you, at least, at least in those earlier stages. Every business that they want to survive now needs to be involved in doing some form of inbound or content marketing. But in order for them to succeed, we're going to have to make content that people love. And I'm going to talk about some lessons learned about how you can do that right the first time. Because there are many people who thought that's what they were doing when they were working with me, come to find out after many hours and many months that it was not actually what they were doing. And I'm going to talk about how to avoid that. But everybody loves stats and bar charts and stuff like that. This is some old data. There's even uh, newer data to back this up, you know, uh, out there. But inbound is, has, a, has a better return on investment even before COVID-19. Um, it just statistically, we're seeing a far better set of results from when from marketers. There's a survey of marketers from small businesses of five employees or less and, and businesses of 200 employees or more. So there's a spectrum of a couple of thousand businesses that HubSpot surveyed for this data. And we're seeing that they're, that they're saying the returns are there. So in this environment where every business needs more business to survive and they need to pivot quickly to make that happen and meet the, the rapidly shifted consumer uh, preferences, this, what we're going to talk about today, if you do it right, if you can learn some of the secrets to do it right the first time around, will create more leads. And what I'm going to talk to you about came from my experience seeing HubSpot practice it themselves. This is just a vignette of some pictures just to show you over four and a half years when I was at HubSpot, it was around employee 250 when I joined and stayed with them all the way through their IPO and a uh, year after their IPO in 2014, um, that HubSpot themselves absolutely crushed it using blogging, SEO, and social media. And when I was there, and this is, these are 2011, 2012 numbers, they were generating 50,000 quality leads to feed their sales team every single month. And then it was 55,000, then it was 60,000, then it was 70,000 leads a month. And it's, it hasn't stopped. I've got to watch the blog go from a million views a month to 2 million to 3 million to them going, how far can we take this thing? And they haven't stopped. So we, I got to see the company get great success, but it wasn't easy. There were struggles along the way. And, our, and we passed those lessons learned onto our customers, and I'm going to pass them on to you, uh, alumni entrepreneurs, as well. I do want to make a disclaimer because uh, Joe, had Dad pointed out, I've had a relationship with HubSpot. I'm very close with the company and the tool and so on, but I don't work for HubSpot. I'm not here strictly representing HubSpot. So hopefully nobody minds if I keep it real today. I'm going to give you real talk from this is the inside scoop, not the commercial that I might be somewhat obligated to tell you about. Um, so hopefully folks want some real talk here today. And it starts right here. Everybody struggles with trying to do inbound, with trying to accomplish some of those outcomes I just showed you. In every instance, HubSpot, the company, and, and every company that I work with, the 200 plus companies that I onboarded from small scrappy startups to large multinational, you know, billion dollar plus enterprises, in every instance as I worked with them in their first shining few months of, of using HubSpot, their inbound marketing tool of choice. I was, the, I was the implementation consultant, I should mention. I was one of the first people you would meet. You bought the product, you want to do inbound, and then boom, now you're going to get on board. Every single instance, there was some, at some point in their first few months working with me, there was wasted time and effort, something they had to redo or do over. There was procrastination, paralysis of analysis. What should we do? How should we act? What should, what should we publish? Deadlines delayed, things they said they were going to get out that didn't get published, sales targets missed, sometimes careers put in jeopardy. And yes, in some instances, the whole implementation blew up in, my, in our faces and they, and they quit, they gave up. So I just want you to know, you know, those last few things weren't in every account, but in every account, there was a struggle. So that when you get started with something like Inbound and using an intimidating, because it's so powerful and so comprehensive, a platform like HubSpot or any other competitors, it's, there's going to be struggle. That's not, that's not you doing something wrong. I think what was, oh, and I have a slide to even point that out. Because this is what the data would look like, folks. Um, th these are actual screenshots from customers I had worked with and where they, and, uh, where they were at. So this is a traffic, this is an analytics screenshot of monthly traffic to a site. And some of these companies, when I'd worked with them, they're losing ground. Look at that. They were at a higher number and then they're going down. Does that mean that they were failing? No, because look, they stuck it out. And here's the other side of the story. This is actually one of the more successful customers. So if you're coming in to take over marketing at your company, or you had to take over the last person they, they axed and got rid of, um, and you're losing ground, that's okay. That might be part of your journey. What doesn't show up on this graph, folks, is what happened in the months leading up to before that turn 
happen, what the, the growth, the education, the experimentation, the learning, the grit that had to take place. And I got to witness that with these marketers and business owners, entrepreneurs that I've worked with through onboarding. What about another one where you're treading water? Sometimes you're going up one month and then you're back down again. And you're up one month and you're back down again. Does that mean we should quit? Does that mean that this whole inbound thing isn't going to work for us? No, because if you stuck it out long enough like this customer did and didn't quit, they're on their way to success. These are all real companies. Some of, them, some of them are B2B, some of them are B2C. Maybe you're actually with an organization right now that's doing quite well, like this, like this customer. Their lowest month in the last few years was 50,000 unique visitors a month, if you're following the chart. 50,000 unique visitors a month, I'd take that, wouldn't you? I don't know many websites that have that, but maybe you didn't come here to this session or to think about doing inbound marketing just to settle for okay. Maybe you want industry dominance. You want to dominate the thought leadership. You want to be the place on the internet where people come to learn and be educated and build trust around your industry. And you want to change the game like this company did. Now 50,000 is chump change. And I, I'm here to tell you this particular organization, they're three times that traffic now uh, from when I took this screenshot. And folks, that had nothing to do in each of these circumstances and other charts I could have shown you, it had nothing to do with how big the company was or how small and scrappy and agile their startup was. It had everything to do with just a couple people, sometimes one key person and the growth and the change they were willing to go through to get things done. And so if you're an army of one or if you're the single believer in inbound in your team of 20, you can make it happen if you're willing to educate yourself like you're doing today and grind it out. And I'm gonna talk about some of the shortcuts and secrets to get through it because folks, I've concluded from having talked to my customers and reflected on them, what would they do differently the first time around is they couldn't really get out of the struggle part. The struggles actually are milestones to success. And when I thought of it that way, that's how I came up with this idea of doing an inbound reboot. And I have five secrets that when I talk to those customers, that when they encounter the struggles, these are the secrets to get through them. So instead of, so in each section, I kind of talk about, these are the common struggles you might be in going through right now if you're trying to implement inbound or using HubSpot, or these are the struggles that you might face if you haven't done it yet. But I'm gonna talk about it from an angle of what are the secrets to get through that struggle as efficiently and sustainably as possible. Not, go, not avoid it, not go around it, but get through it as efficiently and sustainably as we can. Uh, so, and by the way, folks, one of the things that you'll be seeing throughout the deck, and I've already seen questions show up in chat, is there'll be a hyperlink to get the deck and all the key resources. So if I show you something on the screen, you wish you took a photo of it, screenshot of it or whatever, you're gonna get a copy of the deck. I think Joe's already assured you of that. So I don't want you to be scrambling to have to write down notes the entire time. You can just stay with me and chat in the chat screen um, as you like. So let's go in without further ado, getting organized. Folks, when I would get new customers, they had this expectation because they had seen HubSpot and how it seemed so tight, their marketing message and the inbound methodology and all that type of thing. They just want to get a piece of that action. So they figured, hey, job's, job's over. I bought HubSpot. Nick's on the phone with me now as my onboarding consultant. Tell us about what we should be doing, Nick. Tell us about the strategy. You know, they say, listen, we've got, they'd be airing all their dirty laundry to me. We've got, you know, these, you know, sales doesn't talk to marketing. Uh, marketing's wasting their time on uh, these silly outdated playbooks. And, you know, Nick, how can we just kind of HubSpot that? get rid of that. But the fact of the matter is, folks, HubSpot and the platforms just like them are not your inbound marketing strategy. Sorry, if that's what you were hoping. That might be the simple answer, but this isn't simple what we're talking about. Uh, getting massive outsized advantages in your industry is not always a simple thing. This is a platform to execute your strategy. So what I want to get into now are some tips to help you get organized around your strategy so that your HubSpot or whatever platform you might choose to use is humming. All right, and now listen, you might say, I already know about project management. I'm already well familiar with this, Nick, but don't mistake familiarity with success and execution. Let's think about this in the context of your inbound marketing assignment. Um, and for the first step, drafting a project charter, which to me is a huge success factor um, here. You could call this a memorandum of understanding or a scope of work, but in my opinion, what many customers struggled with is they did not have their expectations and the assignment for themselves internally in writing. So they had no control over how they were going to use their time, the types of tasks they'd be or, you know, organizing and doing, who in their company would be weighing in on the content, um, who they would be reporting to, who would sign off, will they ever be getting any resources to help them out, how much time can they, they, can they devote to training and education, what might be some of the key milestones they should be achieving, by what date, 
How would they be working with other departments that this might be impacting sales, customer service, executive leadership, or otherwise? How often would they be allowed to report out to the team? How often would key stakeholders be meeting with them? You see what I'm saying here? These things are hard things to think about, especially when you have never managed a project like this before, and probably neither has your boss or your executive team. And now that I work in the agency world, we wouldn't dream of d diving in with a customer without having this stuff spelled out. We spend hours with a, with a prospect before we would ever take them on as a client to get these things clarified. That's half of why they seek us out. So if you're, if you're on your own there and you're trying to think about getting into inbound or maybe you've just been stumbling through HubSpot and struggling, most customers I talk to know they're not using HubSpot as well as they could have, as, as efficiently as they could have. Start putting this stuff out. This is a charter template that I made for HubSpot Academy. That's what I, one of the jobs I had when I was at HubSpot was creating training and education material for HubSpot Academy. I suffered from this problem too. I had no control over the scope of the timeline. Someone would fly in in a meeting one time and just say, hey, no, add this, make content for this. And I thought, are they allowed to tell me that? I don't know. Uh, why can't, I've got way too many action items here. I don't have enough time to get it all done. Project charter, project plan, Scope of work, these types of things help. You have to put your project management hat on for these types of things. There's far too many variables otherwise. And even if your charter says, we don't know uh, uh, how much time this is going to take. We are not sure whom else in the company should be involved. Uh, we are not sure if this should be in scope or out of scope for this employee, for this key team member to be doing. Uh, we are still trying to figure out what the exact lead generation goal should be. That's fine, but let that be documented that it is unknown because otherwise key team members will have selective amnesia as to what was sort of agreed upon and what was clear and what was unclear from the beginning. Okay. This is just, again, word from years of experience. So think about this when you get, when you get off the session today and when you're working with your team, your colleagues, your co-founders, your boss or whomever, you say, is this a project? Am I going to be the manager for this project? Then before I commit, we need to get the assignment and the expectations, what we know, what we don't know written down and in writing. What the risks are, how we're gonna handle the risks. What the rewards are, when we're gonna get them. Those types of things, okay? Charter. Next thing that also helps for project management is, is a tool called the Darcy chart. This isn't a HubSpot tool, but this is a very good inbound project management asset. Here's a screenshot of HubSpot Inc's own internal Darcy chart when they took on an assignment and they blogged about it and told us about it. They have, uh, the Darcy stands for these people. Decision makers, these are the people we get to sign your paycheck who get to sign off on the HubSpot bill. They have the power to kill this initiative. Then we have the person who's holding you accountable. And you, sometimes those are the same people. So might, sometimes this is called a racy chart. You can Google all this. Uh, but then there's the person who's responsible, the person who's making the call, making it happen inside the tools, doing inbound marketing, publishing the blog post. That's most often the person I work with. That's most often who you might be if you're like the person who's in charge of getting inbound off the ground at your organization, if you ever do that, if you're currently doing that. But I wanna show you there's a couple other columns. There's the consulted column. And that's an important column because people will have opinions about this thing, won't they? About your content, about the strategy, about the design, but they're not in the R column. It's not their responsibility. They're not report, they're not accountable to somebody else. They can consult, they can advise. So it's important when everyone will be excited about doing inbound, they all think it's important, they all wanna weigh in, know that most of those people are in the consulted column. You take their advice and then you gotta make the call because you're the one who's mapping to the accountability person. And also there should be the informed column because we did this at HubSpot. You gotta make sure, there's not enough people making sure you're telling the rest of the company who's not involved, who's not weighing in, how things are going, what is happening about this fantastic transformation to inbound that your business is, is taking as you become more of a publishing company and a media company and educating company out there on the internet. So make sure you're always remembering, am I keeping everybody else informed? Because I may need them to spread the word and be involved and I need them to back this initiative. So this is a great tool for organizing the people. So the first things we saw, we were gonna organize the assignment. Now we organize the people. Now you need to organize your conversion mach machine. So now we're getting to the fun part, right? Organizing those assets and those funnels and stuff in HubSpot. This is a graphic. Uh, that we used for years. And I love it. I love the idea of visualizing what you're doing because I'm just more of a visual person. Most managers and bosses and investors will say that they are. And I just think, because when you buy a tool like HubSpot and many other tools, it just starts like as a blank. It's just a dashboard with a lot of little drop downs to go into different sub tools and sub dashboards. You don't really see the blueprint. This is the cathedral we're building. This is brick one. This is brick two. This is brick three. So I like making graphics like this. And this was a simple graphic somebody made in an afternoon. You can make your own using 
PowerPoint or flowchart tools, but I think it's nice to see these are the stages that people go in to buy something, whether they're online or walking down the street and coming into stores like we used to all do, right? These are the questions that they're trying to get answered at each stage. And here's the content, the, yes, the blog posts, the eBooks, the guides we're gonna create because we can't see them face to face anymore all the time. We're gonna create, we're gonna package that up in content so that there's something we can educate and teach them at each stage of their buying journey so they can follow that along when they want. We have assets to convert them and keep track of when they're at each stage. And we're gonna kick off some emails, some drip emails to keep in touch with them so they don't forget about the journey they're on with us and we keep them moving along down the funnel. This helps you see what we're building. This helps your team see what we're building. And you can also then make sure that you aren't missing anything as you start to fill in these boxes. Got that made, got that built, got that set. Here's a couple of examples from the trenches I pulled in for you. Uh, we do this for clients. And yes, this takes time, but look, you can see it's, it's flow chart tools, mind mapping tools. Many of these tools are free. Start to scope it out. Start to, start to map it all out first before you get all in there and start setting stuff up. That's very, very helpful. Uh, if you're looking for a book that kind of captures the type of funnel we're trying to build all in one, this is a very recent book that came out in March. Sorry, the graphic isn't that great in, in retrospect. It's called Marketing Made Simple by Donald Miller. This is to me this year's simplest person, simplest guide to what we're trying to build here, building a sales funnel. That's a great book. Quick read. Last thing on project management, then we'll keep moving here, is to document everything. So luckily, companies like HubSpot have great product documentation. There's step-by-step -step projects I'll show you in a little while and, and how-to documents for pretty much everything. But the best customers folks, the ones who did it right the first time around, didn't stop there. They took that know-how and then they created wiki pages, they created base camps, they created SharePoint areas where they then wrote up in their own documents, this is how we do this part here. This is what's going on. Here's the project charter. Here is how we do blog posts here. Here is where, how we publish on social media. Here is the SEO strategy. Document everything. Make this your own. Start to create your own culture and, and knowledge base of procedures so this becomes an institution uh, in your organization. This is some of the organization starts to own. It's not a hobby or something floating out here. Um, this is an example uh, when we've done agency work. We're so obsessed with this idea of documentation. We even created our own playbook for playbooks. This is how one actually writes up a policy or procedure around how we do inbound. And this allows us to scale with more staff. This allows us to have consistent outcomes. Um, and this allows us to also partner with other people because we can say, this is how we do it, freelancer. This is how we do it, agency. So just follow this process. It's extremely powerful and often dropped ball uh, for people as they get started here, okay? Now, so that is again, getting organized on day one. And folks, if you're even just making an effort towards this, because no customer I ever worked with had all of these things, but the best customers showed evidence of being aware of a need to be a project manager. They had experience being a project manager. And if you don't never had that be an official title or concept that you've worked with, yeah, you might need to go get some project management training, PMP certification, if you ever heard of that. I had to go get it when I was at HubSpot Academy. I said, what are we missing here? We don't have this rigor. Uh, and uh, it's dry material, but it is crucially important. Anybody who's, told, anybody who's been successful in these programs will tell you a project management mentality is crucial to not waste time, to not waste effort, and to not have the whole thing go off the rails. Because I could give these customers folks all the best practices and cool tips and tricks and try this new feature, but without things being organized and under control, their day, their week was still all over the place. And they couldn't keep it under control and they wouldn't, they wouldn't exploit that best practice or cool tool anyways because they didn't have the project under control. They didn't have their time under control. They didn't have the scope under control. Okay. So I have some free resources. I promised I'd show you that URL. So that's probably the one and only note I'd recommend you write down from me today is nicksalinbound.com. It's my own little copy of HubSpot slash HubSpot dash reboot. And uh, that's where I've got this deck and everything else. Uh, and, and Joe said they're going to email it out to you anyway. Okay, so that's number one. Organizing all of those aspects, you will be far more likely to get a, to get a return and a faster return than if you didn't have that. If, if you came to me with even just knowledge or evidence that I'm like, hallelujah, let's do it, okay? Now, let's go to the next quick win. And you'll see all of these things build on each other. Now that you're in there, you've got the project organized, you've got the people organized, you know what you want to be building for your funnel and, and the tools and the content. Now you've got to make quick wins using what you have. So I want to ask you folks, anybody who's worked on anything like this, content projects, we've got to work with a cross-functional team of collaborators who are 
you know, kind of quasi loosely bought in. Has anybody worked on something where you needed a contribution from another team member? They were going to get you a, get you some material, some copy. They were going to keep an appointment with you to meet with you, to interview them or something like that. Or they were going to review a draft or something like that of yours and they didn't follow through. Can I just see that in the chat? Has anybody experienced that? Where you, you thought, I need to get this out. And the other team member just wasn't as bought in, didn't follow through on this. Megan knows, Joe knows, yes, yes, Athena, Salma. Are you ready for the truth now about that? The cavalry ain't coming. The cavalry ain't coming. Now, I know they said they were bought in. They were excited. Yes, inbound, content marketing, smarter internet marketing. We should be doing that. But they were bought in, and they know they need to change their, own, their old ways. But they're only bought in like kind of because they don't really understand what their role is going to be in that, how that kind of maps to your responsibility. And these folks are smart enough not to jump in head first is what I've learned. They're going to be waiting for you, your overhead. And let's say HubSpot or whatever software, big investment you just made, they're waiting for that to pay off just a little bit. I've seen this again and again. Why didn't, you know, they say, Nick, they didn't show up for the appointment. Nick, they said they were going to get the draft blog post for me and they didn't. They said they were going to review the email and they didn't get back to me. It's because they don't think it's worth their time. They don't know if this is going to work yet and they don't want to go down with your ship. That's, if I can be honest, what I found is, the, is, is going on there. So you have to keep charging ahead, folks, on your own until you get some big win that matters to your company. Now, you may already be in lead gen paradise and you generating leads from the internet, quality leads is a foregone conclusion. That's, that's what you folks do all day. I found the majority of business, even still today, that's not familiar to them that they always generate net new inbound leads from the internet. So to me, the first milestone to get sales and marketing and executive teams all working together is you produce a quality inbound lead, an inquiry, a contact, that could not have been sourced from your company by anyone else any other way besides them finding a blog article, finding you on social media, being intrigued by what you taught them in that article, what you showed them in that article, and then filling out a form to contact you. Until that happens, folks, no matter what anybody else tells you, you're on trial. This whole thing is on trial. And you cannot stop. You cannot waste a day until that happens. You need to be sweating until that happens. It's probably the biggest truth I'll tell you today uh, because I've seen folks say, yeah, my boss says it's all right. You know, it's not going as fast as we hoped, and it's been harder for me to do this on my own than I, than I hoped, but I'm hoping they'll come back. They, they say they're going to get around to me next month, and then boom, HubSpot's canceled, or they're fired, okay? So just remember that that's the case. And so when I asked some of the most successful customers, and yes, the firm I'm at right now, Media Junction, uh, was a customer that I onboarded nine years ago, but they grinded it out, folks. This is a quote from Trish Lassard, our CEO. And I said, when you look back, Trish, on those first days working with me nine years ago, getting started with this, when they had even less features, less documentation, what was it like for you? And this is what she said. You can see it. She was grinding it out, staying up late, putting in time and effort she didn't have to make it happen. And now, I mean, she was a struggling agency at that time. She had just a few people on her staff, check to check. Now she's got 25 people on staff, multi-million dollar agency. And as you heard in the beginning, one of HubSpot's few elite tier, best of the best partners. And I tell you, that comes from Trish realizing the cavalry is not coming. I've got to get the post out. I've got to review the email. I've got to go it alone. So I have to ask you, are you ready to become an inbound team of one? Again, even if you're this sole believer on a larger team, you have to look at it that way. If it is to be, it's going to be up to me, at least until that first inbound lead comes in. And then sales is going to go, wait, what? You got that lead from where? Not from the trade shows, not from the mass email blast, not from us scraping names off the internet. You actually, somebody came to us, thought what we said was useful and helpful to them and not too pitchy, and they want to talk more. They're going to say, tell me more about how to help you do that, right? So here's some quick wins for you to get sales in that mode for you, because that's, that's the milestone we need to go through as inbound marketers. One, Start with, as I said, tactics that will get more appointments for sales. Duh, but it's often not where people focus. They start writing high level, fluffy, top of the funnel, pie in the sky uh, blog posts that aren't directly tied to people being in shopping and buying mode. So to get ruthless with this, focus on the bottom of the funnel, the contact us page. Almost every website has a contact us page. How could that page be improved? How could you do something better than just contact us, right? How could you do get a free consultation? Speak to an expert, not a sales rep, an expert in our product. Uh, maybe it's request a demo. Maybe there's already a request a demo page on your website and your company and what you do. You want to revamp that page. You want to improve that page. You want to optimize that page using HubSpot, using inbound best practices. You know, 
start with things that sales is going to appreciate right away because they got more appointments. Write blog articles that answer frequently asked questions that you have heard come up in the sales process. Write blog articles, write, create white papers and eBooks that crush objections that sales reps are running up against every day. Get that stuff that they'll appreciate so that people start associating what you're doing with a revenue enabling initiative, a sales enabling initiative, not just another marketing experiment. Okay. Number two is lean on content, which has worked well in the past. And you might say, Nick, we don't even have any content. And I say BS to that. Every business um, that has been uh, in business for more than six months or so, oh, thank you, Ileana, who's heading out, um, has, you've written long emails to prospects or clients. You have created proposal documents, perhaps. Maybe you've created uh, prospectuses or, or pitch decks for investors and things like that. That is all excellent content that can be boiled down and turned into uh, articles. If you have made some sales in your business, look at what the best sales were. The ones that your colleagues or your boss say, I wish we had 20 more of these sales this month. And be an anthropologist and look back, what was emailed, what was sent, what was clicked, what was said over the phone or otherwise. And can we turn that into articles, turn that into content? And can I put it in my funnel graphic that I showed you? That's how you can make that happen. Start, start. Those are quick wins because it's already ready. It's already content that had been sent out in some way, shape, or form. It won't be political to get that approved or, or things like that because we're already willing to say it one way or another. Okay. This third bullet, plan your persona interviews. If you're not familiar with this, if you want to create good content people will love, you should be interviewing key people in your target market, existing customers today or customers you wish were your customers today because they're such a great fit. And, at, and while you're asking them things that we ask, we try to form a persona about somebody like, what websites do you like to visit? What's a typical day for you in your role? What jobs are you trying to solve? What are the challenges in your, you know, your industry? Where, uh, what, what thought leaders do you respect? You could ask them, hey, could I actually take some of your answers and blog about it? And I'm happy to quote you or, or attribute you. And most of the time people will say, yeah. And folks, I even have an example of I did this with a prospect of a client we were working for. And I say, can you tell us, we want to, I'm calling because we're interviewing about blog posts, get your feedback, your sort of user feedback, how you make our site more interesting for you. And I found out later from the client, that person ended up buying because of the conscientiousness of the client to hire us to go and interview these prospects so we can make better content for them. None of the competitors were doing that. So it's just an example of getting double duty with everything that you do. As a busy army of one marketer who's got probably very little resources in the beginning, you need to have everything you do like two for one, like that example. Persona interview gets me more insight into how I'm going to market, but I also get a blog post out of it. You know, that type of thing. This one, oh man, I love this. Host a webinar. What do you think we're doing right now? Um, webinars, I'll tell you, stick your neck out. If you buy HubSpot and you get started with inbound, say, I tell you what, four weeks from now, I don't know how we're going to do it. We're putting on a webinar, answering some of the common questions and challenges people see in our industry, buying from companies like us. Maybe it's going to feature some of some, uh, the sales reps that you're hooking up with appointments. Here, maybe it's going to feature some of those customers you've been interviewing about their persona and about their interests and how we can blog better for them. And if they're not willing to be on the webinar with you, they don't have enough time and that can't make the time, ask if you can at least quote them or use them as a case study. The point is, this will build urgency for you. A webinar, we have to be ready on that date. And it's also going to build urgency for your audience, your contacts, your email list, your customer list, because the webinar is happening on a certain date. And yeah, maybe you'll offer the recording out, but they don't have to know that. Right. So now if you do all these things, folks, the last bullet here, now you have something to actually tell your email list, tell your that dusty old contact list of yours to say, hey, listen, there's been a change in the air. We've got some webinars, we've got some some blog posts here from people featuring people in your industry. We'd like you to come check it out and give us your feedback. And if you do that, that'll put you in a good position for what I want to talk about in the next chapter here. Um, but I'll say check out these step by step projects right here. Uh, inside HubSpot, they have step-by-step -step how you go, at, go about uh, creating projects like this. It's already spelled out for you if you use a tool like HubSpot. Now, if you, if you are getting great content out, how do you actually check to make sure that the content is great? Because this is a drop ball is they put content out and then chances are the, the audience doesn't really like it. So how do you make sure you can check if your content is actually good and useful for your target audience? This is about seeking constant feedback. Tell me about the situation if you can relate folks. If you ever put content out and nobody read it, or had content that people did read, but nothing came out of it. They never subscribed or anything like that. Um, and then maybe you actually had somebody come to your site and they filled out a form, but they weren't in the right target market or they were a competitor spying on what you're doing. This is all depressing stuff. These are struggles that customers I've worked with have messed with. 
So what you want to do is make sure you're getting continual feedback. And I've got a few secrets that I've seen work along the way. One is starting a subscriber snowball. Many companies today, even though if they got into blogging, don't seem to have many blog subscribers. And I think they're, they're not starting with the easy subscribers to get. So, and if you think about it, some very logical subscribers to get, which is like, I don't know, everybody in the marketing department, everybody in the sales department of your company, everybody in your company, why aren't they all subscribing? You can get intimate feedback from people in your closest circle of influence first. And they may say, well, I don't have enough time to subscribe. Why is that? Is the, is the page, is it hard to find where the subscribe page is? Is the, is the subscribe page not making a good enough case as to why you should subscribe? Why aren't you reading the posts? By getting some of your closest people, especially the company who will be honest with you, you'll get direct feedback right away as to what you're doing or not doing well. Then you move on and get all your customers subscribing. Why aren't we getting all of our customers to subscribe to our newsletter, our blog, social media? We're talking to these people every day. We're creating helpful educational content to help them understand our industry better, use our product better. Uh, we should get all these people subscribed. And that, then you start moving on to your prospects. And every phone call with every person that you talk to, you say, hey, we're writing about these, these questions you're asking. We're publishing about these questions you're asking. Do you want to subscribe and get it in your inbox for free? If your sales reps can't close that deal, the free content targeted to your target persona that you're talking to right now, I don't know what we're doing here. So that's going to work. Everybody can do that. Then after you get a list of all your closest contacts in and around your business and industry subscribing, you can now ask some of the, those more engaged people if they'd like to be on your, I've called it a content advisory board, a focus group, a beta testing group, where in an informal email chain, a Slack group, a conference call, you can tell them what you're planning to publish next, what the next landing page or, or download page or demo page is you're planning to make. Ask them if they'd fill out the demo page, show it to them. Ask them if they'd actually read this this guidebook you're gonna spend hours and hours of time on before you go and make it. This is the laziest and easiest way, folks, to get feedback on that type of thing. All right, and then also make sure that you're studying, oh wait, I wanna show you an example. This is another SaaS company, Hotjar, that did this. This is a whole guide they did about how growing your early stage SaaS startup. This should be up your alley, many of you are members here. But you'll see, I took a screenshot, they thanked their members, they thanked people in their industry, and uh, people who were good marketers. They got them involved in writing the content. So they contributed, they sourced the content from their own advisory board. We can do that folks, you can do the same thing. All right, now of course there's good data in HubSpot and other places about how your emails are performing, how your blogs are performing and who's reading it. Make sure you always check that too because people can give you anecdotal feedback, which I hope you write down to share with your management, but you also wanna check the data to be sure they're correct. And folks, no matter what, you are the R in the Darcy chart. You are responsible, so it's your call um, so be conscious of people's feedback, note it, show your management team, show yourself that you checked with folks, but ultimately marketing is still an art as much as it is a science. As you can imagine, there were probably people when I showed this deck, they liked certain slides, other people hated those slides. You got to make the call. You're the R in the Darcy chart, you're responsible. Now I'm coming down here to the end and I'm sorry I'm a few minutes over what I wanted for my timing here, folks. So people have to jump, this will be recorded, the deck will be available. Um, I spent a few extra minutes talking about inbound at the beginning but I'm in my final, final chapters here, if you can still bear with me. So now that you got the content out, how do you do the reporting and tell your key stakeholders, your, your co-founders, your management team, how you did so that we can get those people involved and get the cavalry coming to help you out, to give you more staff, more time, more support, more resources. Um, that is what I wanna talk about next because it's not often talked about in the onboarding programs of these inbound software companies that you can purchase from, I assure you. Uh, because I, uh, all right, so let me tell you what some of the struggles are, what this sounds like when it's not done well. Um, have you ever been in a meeting reporting to somebody and you show some marketing data you're able to show and then someone shoots a question at you like, well, how many sales we drive from that? You know, who, who was involved in that? And it's data you weren't prepared to cover. You felt kind of foolish for not having it. Have you ever had this story where you want to go present, you've got a great presentation, you're really going to get people fired up, and then the, you're the CEO reschedules or your co-founder reschedules, and now it's going to be another month before you can talk about and report on this. Um, have you ever had uh, times when you're presenting and then you get cut off by other folks who are saying, how does this work? You know, what are, what, what are we, uh, tell me more about keywords and stuff, and you run out of time and everybody's sort of confused and it ends in a flustered mess. Um, and then you start fearing reporting at all. And I've had this happen to me, folks, where there were successful marketers who had good results to share, but they weren't prepared to manage the meeting very well, and they got eaten alive in those meetings, and, it's, and they still fired her. I'm serious, that happened, oh my goodness. So don't let that happen. Reporting is deeper than the numbers is what I'm trying to say. It is a whole motion, it is a movement around it, and I'm gonna drill into it briefly uh, here. How the meeting is conducted is more important 
than the actual content, the numbers and stuff that you should report. Here's some things to consider. Have a clear agenda. Obviously, that's going to show you're organized. Make the meetings frequent so that you're going to definitely put that in your charter. Every month, we are going to be meeting about this at least. Practice a little crowd control. So those questions I was talking about, people cutting in, taking you off your timeline, tell them to save the questions until the end. No problem. Make sure you end early so you can do some questions and get some workshopping done. That was the whole point of the meeting. Get people involved to help, educated to help you take action. And make sure you debrief with whomever helped sponsor uh, your inbound uh, implementation and HubSpot. Ask them, did, I, did that help us all look good for, for making this investment or not? Do you have any feedback on how I can better rally this team? These are all very important best practices. Make sure you're educating people before, during, and after the meeting. It's not just spitting out numbers, but help them understand what we're doing here. I don't know if anybody recognizes this on the left side. This is Simon Sinek, the golden circle, why, how, what? People need to be motivated in the why, emotionally, why we did this. Um, so remind them again about the project charter and why we needed more leads. And I got commandeered, I volunteered to help make this happen. And then you can show them things like the inbound methodology from HubSpot, but show them the flow charts and the graphs and the charter that you made to help them understand why we're doing it. All right. And I know some people have to run, no problem. I'm going to wrap up as swiftly as I can uh, without bleeding over anything. And then also make sure, especially if you don't have very impressive numbers in the beginning for your first report, that you recognize all those big wins and the people who contributed along the way, the sales reps, the customers, people who contributed on that webinar that you did. Give a shout out for those folks in the first few minutes before you get into the numbers. And then when you do get into the numbers, folks, just stick with this simple mantra, no matter what you have to show, no matter what it means, whether, whether it looked like it worked or not. What did we try? Because we're experimenting here. What did we learn? Because we're always learning and improving. The data will teach us something. And then what's the next step? We want to show people you've got a handle on it. And that's all they'll really expect from you in these first few months. Try, learn, next step. Have those and then it'll never be bad news whatever happened. We tried that. It didn't work. We're going to try the next best practice now and we're going to do it next month. And this is kind of a ninja move, but definitely consider doing this. If you get people filling out forms and becoming leads or contacts in your email list and your HubSpot, your database, humanize them a little bit. Your boss, your sales rep, your co-founder wants real people to become customers, not just to see bar charts go up. They want to know who are those 50 people anyways. So look in some of the data, and I've done this before, it really worked. Tell a story. Say this content, let's talk about some of the 50 people who filled out the form last month. One of these guys, one of these folks was Monica. This is where Monica came from. As we know from looking at the data. This is what Monica did next a couple weeks later with us. And then we reached out. Now, if you're showing this to people who are on the sales side of your organization and they haven't called these people, they haven't turned into customers because this is early, you can ask sales, did you call Monica? And why not? What more information can I provide you with? What more planning and coordination could we do? Because somebody needs to call Monica. Sales needs to pick up their part. All right, and then, uh, then make the data available so that after the meeting, if they wanna go look at your dashboard, you want them starting to go into whatever tool you're using so they're starting to adopt it a little bit, folks. Okay, because I've seen, if you only have one person using your HubSpot, your inbound marketing software, whatever it is, that person too often can move on, move up, move out. And I've had too many CEOs jump on the phone with me going, uh, Carrie didn't work out, so what's HubSpot? I'm taking over. And you're like, oh my gosh, we are in deep trouble. All right, don't be that person. Get them at least, get everybody at least slightly aware of what's going on and how to, how to log in and get it in there, okay? So um, that is the agenda. And I have a nice um, ebook if you want to read up more about where I got some of those best practices. This is a classic ebook on this topic, all right? And those are also available to download here. So this is the last chapter here. If, you, if you've organized your assignment, You've gotten some quick wins doing some content marketing, got some initial leads. You got feedback from people so you know that you're, how you're going to tweak it and replicate it even better and make it even more lovable next month. And you reported it out to your team so they understand what you're doing. They're fired up and they're motivated to support you even further. How do you get to this next step, which is getting more help? Every marketer typically is overworked, underpaid, and undersupported. So how do you get this next one, which is partnering up? The struggle with finding a partner, a marketing agency partner or whatever, is that these types of things. Um, they don't have the budget in place to do it. They don't know if they should hire somebody internally or hire an outsider. If they were going to hire an agency, they don't know how to shop and pick at the right agency. They don't know how to manage the agency once they do. Or maybe they've actually been burned before. They've seen all these things go bad and now the bo your boss, your partner, whatever it is, is hesitant to invest. These are just some best practices that I'll run through very briefly. Build into your charter, your scope, your memorandum of understanding conditions for extra budget. If we get to this stage and see this result or this much time has passed, then I get this. We'll get more budget or we will consider hiring an agency. If you do get a chance to, to have that budget, 
don't spend it all in one place. Don't sign a fifty, sixty thousand dollar, hundred thousand dollar plus retainer with an agency. Start off with maybe a one-off workshop, an audit. Maybe build that into a mini project. Let's have you do overdo a landing page or the website, and then maybe do a, like a ninety-day sprint together. You can just build up to it over time. Whoever you're working with, outside consultant, contractor, agency, you don't want to be addicted to these people forever. So transfer their knowledge, what they're teaching you, and again, use documentation and capture it so that it can, you can make it your own. And you don't have to honestly shell out money and have it be a, a formal commercial style partnership. You can just have an informal part partnership. That could be cool. Uh, it should be quite open to people here on this call because the Alumni Association is a great stopping ground for you to do that. You could be uh, grabbing virtual lunch with a visionary, somebody who's done this before. They've seen the movie. They've been successful in this area. Uh, maybe you're, um, you know, uh, grabbing late night coffee and stuff with a really organized person, help you organize your, your assignment and stuff like that. You could be staying up late talking to a fellow entrepreneur here from the association. Keep yourself motivated to get through the tough times, get those quick wins. Maybe you could be trading and doing guest blog posts with another great communicator and they can help you write better blog posts, better emails as well. And this last one is very interesting folks, especially for Harvard alums, that the market is scrambling to meet the screaming demand for qualified, experienced, knowledgeable, confident inbound marketing professionals. Form a partnership with your local university. Tell them the story of your project charter, your uh, quick wins that you got, um, the feedback that you got from customers, and then show them some of the reports that you reported out so you can get people fired up to intern for you. You can train them up and grow your own HubSpotters. That is really the key. So maybe it's somebody that you'll meet within the Harvard Alumni Association, this entrepreneurs group. You guys can mentor each other. It's the saddest, most ironic thing, folks, for there to be lonely inbound marketers, for there to be lonely entrepreneurs. And there's way too many of them, isn't there? Uh, we need to be networking and connecting with each other and supporting each other saying, you're not crazy. You're not alone. I've been going through these struggles too. We're going to make it. So let's recap again. Get organized. Get quick wins. Seek constant feedback. Report the full ROI and partner up. And folks, as we close, and I will be done in just a couple of minutes, I got to keep it real. There were many companies that I worked with who had all the opportunities, all the advantages to kick butt at this. And despite all of that, they still didn't. It's like the story of the old dog where two friends are hanging out on a porch and they're talking and friend number one's, as they're talking, friend number one's dog in the corner just goes, rawr, 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 rawr. and they all keep talking. And then friend number one dog again goes, rawr, 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 rawr. finally, friend number two goes, hey, what's wrong with your dog? And friend number one says, oh, he's uh, sitting on a nail. Friend number two is like, why doesn't he get off of it? And friend number one says, it probably doesn't hurt enough yet. And that's like your organization sometimes, right? It just doesn't hurt enough yet. We're whining, we're complaining, we're wanting, and yet here we are. And folks, sometimes you have to ask yourself, is marketing the problem or is your business the problem? Let's be real. Marketers need to tell a good story and as we often say, it's hard to tell a good story about a piece of crap. And I don't mean necessarily your product's a piece of crap, but maybe there's just no vision, no alignment, or no organization in the business. And if you've been at that for a good 12-month push, folks, you might need to try something else. I don't want that to be the case, but there are way too many companies that can do this and that should do this and that could use your expertise in making it happen. Or maybe it's you. I don't mean that, obviously. You wouldn't be on a webinar like this today if that wasn't the case. I know you want to get the knowledge. I know you don't want to mess this up. You don't want to go through the minefield first. But I want to give you a little kick in the pants here as we head out of here and say that excitement is not enough, folks. Just going to the webinar is not enough. You need to strive. You need to start going through the struggles. So that's where the real learning and the real success is. Because remember the slides I showed you at the beginning, for folks. It's going to feel so good once you get through it. If you follow these secrets, we know your marketing ancestors who've gone before you. We've been to that mountaintop of that chart. It's going to be awesome. And I can't wait to see you there. Uh, if you have questions, let me know. But just remember, that <laughs> chart and many like it were done by people who had less going for your organization, uh, less going for them than your organization does. I assure you, you can make it happen. Thank you. Uh, sorry I ran over a little bit, Joe. Hey, Nick. No, really, thank you so much. That, that was really uh, insightful. And we've received a ton of questions um, I know you blocked off an extra we do have 30 time. minutes. Okay. Uh, Regina, is it okay if we go over at 2 p.m. Uh, to answer? Because we've gotten so many questions. Uh, and since this is recorded, if anyone wants to drop off, uh, feel free and you can watch the recording yes. uh, later. Yes, so, Nick, you, uh, yeah, let's just run through some of the questions so folks can Please. submit. And then I had a bunch of questions regarding the flywheel and then 
uh, micro content and, and social media content. So John let's is asking, go. let's wrap. Yep. John is asking, what's the best way to make sure your personal uh, social media brand are well aligned with the company's marketing efforts? Okay, John, some things that I, that I just do is obviously make sure everything goes out on the company feed and then you can, you can first of all comment on it. And if you, you read the article commenting on it, hey, that was a really great post or thank you so much, the author of the post. Like, is that, is that wrong for us to actually call out a teammate and say, hey, good job for writing that article. Good job for putting that out. Good job for posting this on social media. Show the team spirit. So your first, your brand should be seen as a great fan and, and a supporter of your company's brand and the content they're putting out, then you can also share it out onto, onto your own LinkedIn profile, of course, and say, you know, there's a discussion going on around this, or we just wrote about this. I'm just curious what people in my network are thinking. You know, we put this out to the public, but I'm sharing this because I want to know what people on my Twitter following or my LinkedIn network think about this. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Let me know. And I'll let the author know. Stuff like that, uh, John, just com comes to mind. Um, and obviously, you, you're going to want, in that case, that make sure your, your, your profiles are cleaned up. Mm -hmm. for sure great uh next question kind of in line with what you said about project management megan is asking how do you keep people motivated to follow the standard operating procedures the documentation process usually the resistance is fear of losing their job becoming placeable once that process is all documented yeah well we have to show them that this is going to help make their job more successful either that or we're creating the wrong content or we're asking the wrong people to help as I said before, the content we should be starting with is the stuff that helps drive sales or revenue for the company. If somebody says they are against the company achieving sales or revenue, then I would be worried about their job future because they're totally misaligned as to what we're doing here. I mean, assuming that yes, all other values of the culture are preserved, of course, right? But we're in a business to generate revenue. We need to have customers to do that. Mm -hmm. So we want to create content that is answering, again, common questions that are coming up in the sales and shopping process anyways, common objections or misconceptions that are being thrown our way as to why people are telling us they're not buying or why we lost the deal. If, if we can go to those people and say, help me write that content for you, featuring you so that you can be more efficient in your job. I don't want to hear from a sales rep who wants to justify having to spend an hour manually writing the same email with the same answers to the next prospect when that could have been written as an article which could be dropped in the email in seconds and then tracked to see if the person clicked and stuff. It's just smarter to do it this way. So you just show them you'll be more efficient. I'm trying to basically document and enable your own process. Uh, I, I, think, I think of sales as being one of the biggest um, yeah. objectioners here. And, and if it's an executive or something like that, fine. Again, you're, you're going to have to accept the inbound army of one because I fell for that trap and I thought my CEO should be more bought in. This was years ago and we got nowhere and they're still going to blame you. So instead, you're going to say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to write it anyway. I, I won't get them involved then. I'm going to have to do it myself first. And that's going to be sad, but you will. You may have to just do it all by yourself. You might have to make it up and research it all by yourself in the beginning. But the first person who believes in you, you recognize them in the reporting. You say, thank you, Jane, for taking the time to let me interview her and quote her in that article. Thank you, Jane, for promoting the article, at least, to your network and stuff like that. That's how you start to build the cultural transformation. That's why reporting is so important. And why I said it's important to do quick wins and shout outs, even before the numbers start to show, because you want to show that at least people are starting to get on board. Great. Lo love the energy, Nick. Uh, <laughs> Ath Athena has a couple of questions. So she's asking, what are the best ways to activate old customer lists? Maybe some that are two or three months old that expressed interest uh, in the past. Sure. A couple things on that, Athena. Number one is, can you break the list up into different into different sub lists based on when they bought, what they bought, I don't know where they bought it from, like what store or branch or something they bought it from. And at least just have your email. You've got a good chance of any, anything you're going to say next to the email working. As long as your first sentence establishes, hey, I actually segmented you out. You're in a group of people who in some time in the last two or three years, you bought from us. I've, been, I've sent Athena these emails a couple of weeks ago because I'm re-engaging our, our database as well. Say so sometime in the last two or three years, you expressed some sort of interest in working with us or you had worked with us in the past. I'm reaching out because, and now you need some news. You need to say, because there's been a change in the air. We've got a webinar coming up. We've got some blog articles we put out. We're interviewing past customers or past prospects who fit our ideal profile of which you fit. And I would love to have you read this. I'd love to have you download it. I'd love to interview you to get your feedback on it. So when you have good, useful content that's meant to help people in that list, there should be no excuse as to why you shouldn't email them. 
Um, it's just all you should do is point that out. Say, I'm emailing you because I know who you are and you were a past customer and you have something special to offer me. That's an email that people will not mind seeing. If you email them saying, want to buy this now? 10% off, free gift card. That's spammy, salesy. And they go, eh, psh, they don't get me. They're just trying to shove more product down my throat. Mm -hmm. And what's the good conversion rates? Right. So people always ask this, and I don't want you to get obsessed about it. Like you can't begin without knowing it. Number one is you're in a mission to find out. The, yes. So what we, that's one of your goals, maybe in the charter is to say, we're going to find out what our good conversion rate is at HubSpot. We didn't look at what the industry did. We saw what we did last month. The good conversion rate was one that was slightly better than what we did last month. The good amount of leads to get out of our, of our offers and our content was what a little bit more than what we got last month. But I understand you need benchmarks. So to me, it's just whatever is a logical good benchmark. You Google around good conversion rates, click-through rates, you'll start to see stuff from MailChimp, from HubSpot and others, and then just kind of pick a good round number somewhere in the middle there because it's truly a benchmark. It's a guess. Um, you can't say that every landing page will convert at 20% in the, uh, let's say, salon industry because not every landing page in the salon industry is for the same salon, has the same graphics on it, has the same number of form fields on it, or is for the same thing. So, or it has the same number of visitors coming to that page. So it's really all quite subjective, but I understand the need for it. So you pick a decent benchmark, okay? 30% open rate on emails. That sounds pretty good. You know, two or 3% click-through rate on emails. Let's start with that and see how off I am. You know, uh, 15 to 20% conversion rate on the landing page would be fantastic nowadays. Um, so those are types of numbers you can start with, but I wouldn't be resting on what the industry says. As soon as possible, it should be about based on what we did last time, we're shooting for this. Mm -hmm. So kind of similar a follow-up, maybe what's the most optimal subscription to take to get the best results? Yeah, this is tough because it's been said by other thought leaders before, mm -hmm. offering somebody a newsletter is like a non-offer. So just saying subscribe to our newsletter, you're almost, we're almost wasting our time. We need to tell them what they're actually going to get out of the newsletter. We need to be able to say, we're going to be writing about this topic, this topic, that topic. And you can see the great work that Joe and the team has done. They already kind of did that even for this particular series of webinars you've been on. So can you do some of that like for your own newsletter? Subscribe and you'll be getting things like tips on how to do better in this area. Examples of people who've succeeded in your industry and what you're trying to accomplish with our product or service. You know, and profiles of experts in our team and what they have to say for our customers to be more successful. Now they're like, oh, so that's what's gonna be in the email. Great, oh, and by the way, it comes out only once a month or something like that. That's good. Another thing I've heard to get subscribers, and I've seen this work, is to offer them something as like a, sort of like the Ginsu knives, the, the bonus for doing it. Subscribe to our newsletter and you'll get this valuable thing right away, this webinar recording, this, ebook or, or whatever. Um, and then you still have to do stuff like testimonials. I love subscribing to the newsletter. It's been very useful for me. And again, if you follow what I was talking about in these earlier slides, this stuff will all feed into each other. If you're interviewing and, and meeting with people regularly to get their feedback, it'll be easy to have that testimonial to put on your page. Great. And kind of tactically, where does the content uh, most optimized supposed to live? Is it on the, on the HubSpot blog? Uh, on the blog feature on HubSpot, on your HubSpot platform, on LinkedIn, on Medium? Where do you uh, advise for that? Sure, great question. I do recommend it lives, its home should be on your, your website because we are trying, remember, to, to SEO optimize our main site. That's the site, that's real estate we own. That's real estate that we control. We own all of the ad space, the call to action button space on that site. I want to own that because I can have HubSpot drop tracking cookies on them and so on. But I know that the marketplace, you know, the street, if you will, digitally where people are hanging out is in these other social media places. So I think let's assume that you're also using social media best practices and publishing some thoughtful things on your LinkedIn profile from time to time anyways, so that so people don't only ever see you post when there's a link back to a blog post or something like that. That's just going to look a little spammy. So as so long as you're publishing a little bit just organically, other people's con content, other musings or observations and stuff to try to get conversations going on social, then I think it's entirely appropriate to always publish and promote the links to your blog post, to your homepage on those social media profiles. But I wouldn't just stop there. I wouldn't just say, here's the title of the post, go get it. Go dig into the post a little bit and find a key stat, a key quote, a key takeaway to serve your following, your connections and say, I think it's a great article you can read, you should read, especially this stat towards the end. Mm -hmm. Boom, mind boggling that that many percentage of people never book online or something. 
So I hope that helps. Uh, you want to have it, have it be at home base, but certainly syndicate it out and add some value as you do it to the other mm -hmm. networks so we can track them and, and pull them in and, and the database that we control. I don't control LinkedIn. They can change stuff. They've taken sure. groups away and mm -hmm. stuff. I don't want to bet on that is the home base. Great. Uh, and then in terms of uh, uh, user generated content, you mentioned that earlier, what are maybe some best practice to kind of crowdsource uh, that from some, some members that have subscribed to your community or someone from your mailing list? Yeah, I'll repeat quickly the, uh, the idea of doing like a content beta group or a content advisory board, mm -hmm. look already in your data of whatever tool you're using that's showing you this, this is, these are the people who've been subscribing, been clicking through and look for the ones who click through a lot on stuff or maybe you just kind of know anecdotally this person is a really great customer they're a repeat customer they're a big advocate of ours get that person on the phone and interview them and and ask them if you wouldn't mind if you quoted them on that or if you could transcribe the interview um it used to be really easy to to go a year ago to go film people so if you go film your customer get a testimonial from them and just pump them with questions Mm -hmm. and stuff and then transcribe it. You can start this folks. If you're trying to get used to crowdsourcing and getting in info, start with your own staff, start mm -hmm. with the sales, the sales manager, the product manager, the head of customer success, ask them those questions. What are the top questions you get every day? What are the common misconceptions about people in the industry when they try to work with our product or service? You know, what are the top objections and what's your, what's your comeback to those? Those mm -hmm. people are working for you. Those would be, let's get those people to get interviewed first, record the whole thing in quick time or whatever you use, get mm -hmm. that transcribed. And now you got four or five blog posts already written for you. And you don't even need to quote that person if you don't want, but you could. Great. Uh, what about in terms of creating micro content out of some blog posts? What are some advice or best practice to uh, maybe repurpose some of that content and where should yeah. that content live? Yeah, I, I, the, I've, I already kind of alluded to it. I got this from somebody who was a social media maven and I interviewed her and I said, you've got a huge following on Twitter. What do you do? And she said, every post that you want to promote, go dig in and look for the, key, the, the best stat, the best quote, or the best key takeaway. And if you want to do micro content and kind of get repeated exposure for a blog article, because I know you put a blog article out and then you know, if nobody looks at it in Twitter for that 15 minutes, it's gone. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to be that guy or gal just spamming over and over again, even if you can auto program it in Hootsuite or whatever, the mm -hmm. same link, same link, same link. They're going to be like, do I really want to follow this person? Instead, if a post is about to go out, you want to promote it and stuff like that, kind of make some micro content, pick out the three or four best stats, quotes, key takeaways, program those up throughout the week. And now you can actually sort of optimize and test to see, do stats work mm -hmm. best? Do quotes work the best? Do key takeaways work the best? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I would just do it that way. Take every blog post and break it up into little pieces and try showcasing that piece as the, as the teaser to mm -hmm. the rest of the post. Great. Uh, so keep in mind our audience, most of them maybe are early stage entrepreneurs and they might be eligible for the HubSpot like 90% uh, discount. What do you uh, advise in terms of starting out? Uh, what level of HubSpot do you recommend if they have already a robust uh, email list, for example? Yeah, great, great question, great question. So yes, I'm so glad that people know about the HubSpot for Startups program. That's an amazing program that HubSpot's willing to do. So remember, you have to be venture backed. You have to be in some sort of an incubator because HubSpot's taking a big chance. They give you sometimes up to a 90% discount. They're not gonna do that unless they know that somebody's riding you to get bigger and to grow because they're trying to get in with you folks early, let you grow early and then have your gratitude and your addiction to the product, you know, pay off later. So um, I do recommend using the HubSpot for Startups program. Mm. I think that where you want to probably start is, I mean, honestly, you could start with the HubSpot free tools. Mm. Use the freemium tools, then start to get to the starter edition of the tools. And I think HubSpot marketing hub starter is really good. Um, if you aren't obsessed with your web presence, if your web presence doesn't involve web apps and calculators and stuff that are already embedded into WordPress or whatever, I'd get your whole website up and running on HubSpot. HubSpot CMS hub, the web's website add-on is the best product I think HubSpot has on the market right now. It's 300 bucks a month. You host your entire website on there. It does SEO optimization. It has forms to capture leads. It has some limited email automation, great reports and stuff like that. And it has 24 seven customer support. Mm -hmm. So half the reason why, you know, sometimes it's so tough to make your website more dynamic is you have to call an IT person. You have to wait till the freelancer emails you back and stuff. HubSpot CMS hub. So in summary, Joe, I'd use any of the starter tools that are relevant to you because you can learn for free basically and level up with money as you go or jump in with HubSpot CMS hub. If I had to pick one, mm -hmm. I would start there because it has the blogging tool and all that there. Great. 
now you, you did start the presentation with kind of talking about the, the funnel, uh, but then HubSpot CEO uh, says now where, you know, it's the flywheel and the marketing funnel uh, is dead. So what are your thoughts around that? And in terms of getting users yeah. into the flywheel? Yeah, that's, it's inconvenient that Brian mm -hmm. Halligan decided to change that <laughs> because I think it, and I have it, I, I used to have it stuck up here on my wall. I'm with it. All right. I got the flywheel sticker over here somewhere, but yeah. I don't think it teaches people enough. It's driving mm -hmm. home the point that HubSpot really wants to drive home, which is, hey, we've got a customer hub tool here as well. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you bought one thing, remember the next thing needs to be bought too. And mm -hmm. they're actually kind of right. You get more value from doing it that way. Anyways, you get a volume discount if you buy all that together. And it would be nice if all those systems talk together. So the flywheel basically shows that customer support marketing and sales now all must be working together. They should consider themselves as part of one team and, mm -hmm. and neither one of them can truly succeed and have momentum without the other. <clears throat> it mm -hmm. succeeds in that. I don't think it offers enough detail as to, well, what tactics am I focusing on at this stage? Where, where am I taking people from, from this stage to that stage? And then when I get them to this next stage, what tactics am I using there? The inbound methodology graphic had a little bit more of that. That's why I kept mm -hmm. it in the deck. So I feel mm -hmm. like it teaches people a bit more about what tactics to focus to achieve what outcomes along the way. But I, you, you need both, I suppose. Mm -hmm. I don't okay, think the, the flywheel makes the funnel completely obsolete mm -hmm. because frankly, people aren't even paying attention in your company as to what you're talking about, what the difference is. We're all the geeky people who care about that type of thing. Yeah. You're these executives that can barely spare 30 minutes a month for you to hear about all the work you're doing. Those people, you don't need to mince words with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not going to care one way or another. Yep. I know you recommended starting with the free HubSpot uh, tool. And um, at what point do you advise getting like professional help from like a firm like yours or reaching yeah. out to an expert? Well, I would say this. Once you have read everything you could read, like you watch the certification, like HubSpot has free certifications, HubSpot Academy. I helped make some of those back in the day, the old ones anyway. Like there's a lot of free education. And when I talked with, a, when I did interviews for this talk, mm -hmm. education came up a lot. I didn't want to have that be the only chapter I gave you. Like, yeah, get educated. You're like, yeah, done, Nick. I went to this webinar, didn't I? I want to give you the other stuff. But yes, I think you need to educate yourself on what these buzz terms are. You need to have played with these features a little bit. Otherwise, you're really not going to know or appreciate what this agency, this freelancer, this marketing guru is selling you anyways. Mm -hmm. So I think if you had... I'd say basically, if you, if you had project, if you could go through this cycle that I described here a little bit, mm -hmm. once or twice and get some traction, then I think it's good to work with an agency. And remember what I said at the end about partnering, you could start incrementally. Mm -hmm. So come up with, in my opinion, if you don't have $5,000 to invest, why bother calling anybody besides going on like Elance or Upwork and getting someone to make a graphic for you or write a quick blog post for you or something. If you want a serious partner, five grand to me is like minimum. I think more 10 or 15 grand to get any sort of substantial traction and real like high value agency mm -hmm. style uh, work done. Mm -hmm. So I'd say I would avoid it until you absolutely have to, until you understand how to organize your project. You've gotten some feedback. You've created mm -hmm. a couple articles. You know enough to be dangerous. Yep. Type thing. Great. Uh, so, you, you know, a lot of this talk is around uh, content marketing and, and all that. Can you kind of tie maybe some of the data in um, Google Trends or uh, Google AdWords and kind of uh, reverse engineering the content that you create based on uh, the data that you find on Google Trends and, and such platforms. Yes, you can do that. Uh, but remember what I suggested first, which is to interview people in your target market. Start with doing persona interviews, interviewing people who just, you know for a fact, either because they've been a customer of yours or you wish they were a customer, mm -hmm. that they're in your target market. Then get those people on an advisory board because trends can be deceiving. Mm -hmm. and there's reasons why certain trends go up or down. They, that, that data is all aggregated. So is there somebody in some market in some city who's searching for it a lot and then you didn't slice and dice Google Trends enough? So look, I'm not poo-pooing the idea of doing that research, but I think it should be one slice of how you decide what mm -hmm. you're going to do. So it should be like, oh, my persona says they have questions like that. Uh, when I put it to the, when I, when I, the sales rep says they receive objections like that and Google Trends says topics and words like that are trending up. And when I Google around and I look what my competitors are doing stuff, I'm seeing that too. That, I think it's gotta be a little bit more of a multi-touch thing, but absolutely there are tools like Google Trends and Ask the Public, I think is another one. Mm -hmm. There's blog topic generators and stuff. Yeah, use those, but don't, 
don't feel like you have to be dictated to by those. That's what I think gets people overwhelmed. They're like, I don't know why it's saying that trend is up there. I don't know how that trend makes sense, but apparently the data says, the internet says I have to. Yeah. It's like, no, let real people that you know and care about and that are relevant in your business tell awesome. you. Yeah, it's all about the, the persona and, and kind of understanding their pain points. Yeah, and then awesome. verifying with mm -hmm. the data and trends or spotting a data and trend and see if it's verified with the people. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Uh, that was the last question from me. Thank you to the 13 Oof. participants that, that stick through. Uh, if, does anyone really else have, it, guys. have a question that wants to come off mic and, and ask Nick? Okay, great. Uh, Regina, are you still on the line? Nick, uh, is there any specific call to action you'd like from, from the community? Where I'll go back, follow, I'll go back here. Where? And what I put at the bottom of my page, guys, is I put my, well, I put this on the slide here. It's obviously in the slide deck. It's at the bottom of my HubSpot reboot page. Mm -hmm. But um, if you want to email me and you want to say, and you want to just tell me about your situation, this is what we're trying to do or whatever. Like Joe and I kept in touch from the last time I did a talk. That's why I'm here. So if there's anything I can do to help, I can't promise whatever you email me about, I got a solution for it or I got, you know, I got an hour for you or whatever it is. But please try me. Email me what your situation is. I'll at least email you back. Um, and maybe we can jump on the phone and, and talk about it. So uh, I think that awesome. would be the best call to action is dive into this stuff. Yeah. Let me know what your situation is and, or let me know if anything I taught here worked for you. That's like mm -hmm. what I care about is that somebody didn't have to go through this, the minefield first and have to go through the struggles first because they tried some of this ahead of time. 